We are joined with Michelle Hood, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at American Hospital Association. She will be moderating this panel, and she is joined with four panelists, and they are from Intermountain Healthcare, Sutter Health, Piedmont Healthcare, and Banner Health. So I am going to pass it over to Michelle, but I do want to note that we will be taking questions at the end. So if you have any questions throughout the panel, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will make sure we get to them at the end. So I'm going to go off camera. Michelle, I will hand it right over to you. Thank you so much, Katie, and welcome everybody. I'm glad you could join us today. We're going to do a quick uh, rapid round of introductions for, for our, our panelists, and we're going to start with Katie Logan, who I'd like to particularly thank since she is joining us, even though she's a little under the weather. So Katie, if you would introduce yourself. Yes, thank you, Michelle. Forgive my froggy voice, y'all. So um, Katie, I uh, serve Piedmont as the Chief Consumer and Strategic Planning Officer. Um, you know, I've been with Piedmont 12 years. I'm a recovering management consultant. And within sort of my portfolios in that role, uh, I lead our experience programs as well as our digital innovation. I can tell you just a little bit about Piedmont as a nonprofit, uh, 4 billion integrated delivery system. We have 11 hospitals and other community assets with a 2,600 uh, physician member clinically integrated network. And you may have seen some headlines recently. We are expecting some significant growth here over the 18 month, next 18 months. Um, growing to 6 billion and 18 hospitals, uh, serving a lot of new communities in Georgia and, and certainly making us the largest healthcare system in Georgia. So look forward to being with y'all today. Thank you, Katie. And then we'll go to Kevin Mabbitt. Thank you, Michelle, and good morning, everybody. So. I'm the Chief Consumer Officer at uh, Intermountain Healthcare, which you may know is a nonprofit integrated system based in Salt Lake City, Utah. We have um, physical footprint also in Nevada and Idaho and through outreach are present in seven or eight contiguous states as well. Um, my role includes marketing and communications, but really is to lead out on the consumer experience, whether it's digital or not. I've been here for three and a bit years having come from the Walt Disney Company where I was global head of insight and experience in parks and resorts. And as you may tell from my accent, I'm not from Utah, but I love Utah. I was born in London. We came to the US in 2005. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Kevin. Scott Nordland. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Scott Nordland and I serve as the uh, Chief Strategy and Growth Officer at Banner Health. Uh, Banner is a $12 billion system headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we serve six states. Um, we, uh, for in, as part of my responsibilities in the, uh, as Chief Strategy and Growth Officer, um, I'm responsible for system-wide strategy, um, innovation and, and digital business, merger acquisition and partnership development work, marketing, communications, consumer engagement, and then uh, we manage our um, large uh, service lines horizontally and I'm responsible for uh, orthopedics, oncology, cardiovascular services, uh, women and children's services, and then neurosciences as well. And uh, Banner um, is, has been on a, uh, uh, quite a journey with um, the digitization of our system. Um, it's also an important strategy for us because uh, we get about 25% of our revenues through uh, our health plan uh, premium. Um, we have over a million covered lives, and so it's an important strategy for that as well. So really looking forward to participating today. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Scott. And Chris, Chris Waugh. Good morning. Thanks, Michelle. My name is Chris Waugh, and I lead design and innovation for Sutter Health. And uh, similar to the uh, integrated systems here, we're, we're a large system here in Northern California and a reflection of the U.S. overall with Quite a bit of diversity in the Northern California region that we serve. Um, my job is to work with a dynamic team and bring to life new delivery models within the fifth largest U.S. healthcare delivery model. So how do you uh, create and hatch new uh, ways of being uh, from within the system itself? Uh, similar to Kevin, my background's a bit unusual. I started my career at Specialized Bicycles, spent a decade at IDEO, and then helped One Medical get its start and now have uh, come over to Sutter. So uh, it's really helpful to have that outsider's perspective as you're trying to do transformation from within. 
Thanks, Chris. So we're gonna do um, a round of uh, questions and I will ask um, two of our panelists um, to answer each of the questions that we have. And the first um, two will be Scott and Kevin with Scott going first. So my question is, is you know, as our field uh, develops more and more capability to apply digitization to both our, our clinical and our business workflows, what underlying skills training are you providing to your leaders to help them to think about digitization differently and unlock the, the potential of digital? So Scott. So it's a great question. And I know it's leaning towards a more tactical response, but I wanna start with a little bit different level with my answer, if I could, Michelle. Sure. Um, you know, this is really a cultural change. And I think that's why it's so difficult to get it started and to make it stick. Um, you know, for Banner, this really began um, with our board of directors. So as I mentioned in the opening, we've been on a journey with them, starting with the digital front door um, and the ties to um, consumer excellence, convenience, um, and then moving to the need to really digitize the experience once those consumers get in our system. Um, it's really led to uh, pretty significant tranches of investment that we've made in this. Um, we're probably over 150 million now in, uh, in our digital strategies to move these, you know, the vision forward. Um, the second component, so the board is, is critical. The second component, component is um, really built around our senior leaders um, in and outside the digital space. So we built a series of annual and long-term incentives to ensure that basically everyone's incented to, um, to work together to realize uh, the vision and the strategy. And that was supported at every juncture um, by highlighting um, two of our critical values in this, which was our um, customer obsession and then courageous innovation. Um, so I really believe that you've got to set the example from the top when you're doing this because it is transformational, uh, transformational it is cultural. You can't let digitization feel like it's an experiment or that it's being run by a small group that's off on an island doing kind of their own thing. So we really invested in dedicated resources. It can't be the part time job of you know, others who are, who are doing other work. Um, we've dedicated um, digital and innovation teams to partner directly with our operations and clinical uh, teams to ensure that we're improving processes as we digitize and ideally we're creating best practices. And then we've also engaged our um, performance improvement team because you don't wanna digitize in <laughs> bad practices, right? I mean, so, so it's a heavy lift, like it, you know, it's not just investing in technology, it's really investing in, in changing your entire organization. And then the final piece I'd add, and then I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll yield to, uh, to Kevin, but uh, we also created oversight uh, to make sure that we strengthen the communication and collaboration um, amongst these groups that I've mentioned. So we established the Data Intelligence Council, which I chair uh, to help us with that. That team meets monthly. And it's really important because it's kind of a, a multidisciplinary group that, you know, if, if some of the people that I mentioned earlier, uh, to make sure that we all stay on the same page um, as we are um, moving down this um, digital journey. So it's been really exciting at Banner. I think we've made amazing strides um, and obviously it, it um, has come in uh, to be incredibly valuable given what we've all been living through over the last year, year and a half, so. Yeah, for thanks. sure. You know, I remember back when we were just beginning to think about electronic medical records, I was, you know, in the field for 40 years before joining AHA last April. And, um, uh, you know, the, we used to call that, uh, you don't want to uh, pave the cow paths. You know, you, you really want to get performance improvement uh, in, in on the early stages. So great. Kevin. Thank you. Yeah, and I would echo a lot of what Scott said. I mean, for us scope wise, you know, we're talking everything from things like the DFD, um, telehealth all the way through to how we engage through social web and other digital tools. And in between those, you've got things like electronic forms, registration and other ways to reimagine the workflow. So. And then, you know, we approach it differently somewhat from a leadership as well as from a team perspective. And, you know, from, in, from a sort of training point of view, there of course is technical training, but a lot of this has to do with immersion, oftentimes with um, strategic partners in, in the worlds that they're in that we need to be into. Um, we start really foundationally too. So making sure we've got that change mindset. 
consumer orientation is critical. And as, as Scott said, you know, let, let's kind of ensure we have the right operational workflow before we digitize it. That, that's all sort of prerequisite work. Um, then, then, you know, we think about um, meeting expectations. So as we digitize things, um, it's gonna create different expectations, different needs, um, and, and making sure that people are conscious of those. A, a very simple example is in our digital front door now, you can text back and forth with your provider. Well, if your provider is not in the habit of using text, that's a fail. Um, we can now enable scheduling online, of course, through again the DFD, but if then you show up to the clinic and we're running 30 minutes late and we didn't tell you that's another fail. So we're trying to really make sure people are understanding the need to think about this end to end, um, not just operationally, but from an experience point of view. So the handoffs, the transitions and the physical experiences are just as important as the digital. Um, and, and, you know, that's just a cultural change, as, as Scott said. We, we, like many systems, have been very oriented around operational and clinical perspectives and, and, and kind of flows, never around the consumer. So that's a complete mindset shift that is going to take time to embed. Um, people want to engage in social as leaders. They don't know how to do it. So we have to help them with those kinds of things too. Um, we, we have to help people have different career opportunities conversations and opportunities in development. You know, as we upskill, um, as we take out some of those manual tasks, what do we do um, to really grow people? And, and so there's a lot of career type change as well that we're working through. And then I'll finally end with the humanity. So there's always a risk in going digital that you lose sight of the core purpose and humanity of healthcare. So we're trying to make sure that the, the digital is human and the transitions are human but also that much of this is about clearing the way. So as a clinical clinical um, caregiver, you now can really shine. And so it's a return to purpose. And so brushing off those core skills is as important to digital transformation as digital skills. So with that, Michelle, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Kevin. <coughs> that was great. Uh, lo love that last piece. So this next question is for Chris and Katie, with Chris um, going first. So following up on on those comments, what new skills does our healthcare workforce need to enable innovation and transformation? Chris? Yeah, one observation is, is healthcare, traditional healthcare really lacks the, the visionary side and the builder side. So of course we need data science, of course we need software, of course we need uh, clinical relevance. So making sure our clinical staff are up to date on the latest not often talked about is what's driving that technology. So what's your true north that's really feeding the technology? And of course, we'll say things like consumerization, which is really important, but even deeper than that, you know, where's the big thinking? So for example, if we're capable, which I believe every system represented on, on this panel is, of going towards pre-symptomatic detection of disease, that's looking like in our lifetime, that's, that will happen. That's a fundamental reframe on the care delivery system that holistically changed how, how we think about where the conversation starts with the patient, what the protocol is of the treatment, et cetera. So in pre-symptomatic detection disease, we'll have to reframe how we think about it. Now we look to other industries and we can watch folks like Elon Musk and, <laughs> and others buy up space, which is by the way, for sale in real estate right now, <laughs> uh, and think like, well, what's that have to do with healthcare? And perhaps maybe more than we think, right? So if if Elon's successful with Starlink, we'll have Wi-Fi reliability for all people everywhere. That's really intriguing when we think about health disparities and access to reliable Wi-Fi. So just making sure that there are more visionaries built into the system. And I think that gets a little bit to what Kevin was saying about a mindset. And then backing that mindset, you need the builders. One thing that's also not talked about often is ethnography too, is while I love having all the data coming off of an EMR, What's equally valuable to me is spending a half a day with 35 patients, really listening and understanding what's going on for them. That's, that's far more inspiring and actionable than just looking at the data sets and trying to understand and predict the trend. So, you know, I think, I think obviously you've got to round out the, the talent pool with uh, more digital uh, capability, but you also need to drive that talent pool with bigger visionary thinking. Thank you, Chris. Katie, what would you like to add? 
Oh my gosh, I, I would echo so much of what's been said so far. And I, it just, um, for me, that really, the term is change management, right? As a skill set and a capability within the organization to, to build on everything. Um, the panelists have said thus far, you know, we always talk about disruption and this digital revolution as a way forward as an industry. And, and you know, that fundamental shift in, in workflow and operating models operating models that's like undoing a lot of the hardwiring that's been in place for you know Piedmont over a hundred years right and the way we've always done things and with the great examples given transformation doesn't come with just the implementation of a tool you have to have that why that bigger picture that vision and I feel like oftentimes um, we can find ourselves sort of getting lost in the solution and only focused on that in, in really building that why and purpose behind it. You know, we're moving people's cheese. Some are going to feel empowered. Others are gonna feel fear. And so how do we continue to develop that skill set within our leaders and within our talent um, to help lead that change for the organization, which you know ultimately we want it to drive adoption, right? Not only by the consumers and the people, maybe the innovations intended for, um, but really building out the portfolio in that within our operations as well, um, both ambulatory and hospital. And the one other thing that comes to mind really is training and education programs. I, I don't know about others, but oftentimes it feels very heavily weighted toward technical resources where we say we went live and then we leave the end users behind, right? And we add clicks and they find workarounds. Um, we deploy the latest and greatest tablet that has all the things we need to enable a workflow. And they say it's too heavy and they want an, an iPad. So they put it down and go back to their notepads. And, you know, to really be successful in transforming, we have to get down to that level and, and ensure the sustainability of these innovations um, through things like change and, and investments in, in real ongoing training and education for our teams. That's great. And I, I loved your earlier comment, you know, the continuous training too, you know, it's not a one and done kind of thing. You got to keep, keep, uh, keep going. So this next question is for Katie and Kevin and Katie first. Um, how was your digital transformation journey interrupted or accelerated as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? I love this question because we get to celebrate uh, the fact that it really accelerated a lot of the, the work that we had underway. You know, um, our, digital our digital journey, our digital front door, all these things that we've had have, have largely been centered around the, the patient's experience. And many of our programs focus on creating um, sort of next generation access and hassle-free moments, right? We want it to be easy for people to get in, navigate the health system, whether that's physical navigation or digital. Um, you know, COVID, I think we all experienced this, right? Consumers uh, increased demand for convenience and contactless and just a easy factor in a, a time of uncertainty. And COVID also taught us that we can move faster and leverage a lot of the things that we had in place. So just a couple of examples from Piedmont. Uh, I bet everyone in the room or on your computers will be nodding your heads, but virtual health, right? For us, we had been dabbling in this. It was a slow start. We didn't have much demand. Uh, we were using a third party provider, which was a threat to our physician network and reimbursement um, was questionable. But all of a sudden our patients don't wanna come in for care and they're delaying that care. And uh, it was no longer nice to have. Um, the questions around reimbursement became irrelevant. And overnight, it really became table stakes. So we moved quickly, we used existing platforms, we launched the capability for video and asynchronous, we sunset the old offering, and now we're adding on-demand visits um, to, to further meet people where they are in accessing care. And you know, the second example I'll give you, I think Kevin mentioned this early or around uh, registration and contact lists, right? So before COVID hit, we're on this journey to, uh, we called it the Clipboard Extinction Act. Um, we wanna get rid of the paper 
uh, put it in the palm of your hand from medical questionnaires to those pesky forms that we all have to fill out prior to a visit. And then the ability to just check in um, before you before you arrive. So we started with a pilot, we're moving slowly, COVID hits, nobody wants to touch anything. Um, and you know, further that we've got drive-through testing sites that we need to enable. We've got video visits that we need to enable. And so we went from pilot to big bang and we just turned it on everywhere, ambulatory to hospital. Um, and we added payment collections, which, you know, surprised people would rather pay online um, than call with their credit card. So, you know, our ability to, to just move quickly and the huge spike in consumer demand and therefore adoption, um, you know, what we would have probably taken years took weeks. And I think the lesson for all of us is we were able to build on that momentum um, do things faster. And I just, you know, for Piedmont and for all of us in healthcare, for us to be successful in this transfer transformation, we really had to build on that, not go backwards in that and challenge ourselves to, to keep that momentum and innovation moving forward. That's yeah. cool. That's, that's great, Katie. Uh, all right, Kevin, to you on this question. Yeah, I would say similar to Katie in many ways. You know, we we really didn't miss a beat through the pandemic. We we obviously couldn't have anticipated it, but in many ways we happened to have been prepared for it in in in, in digital terms. So we had um, you know long invested in telehealth, and and we had a pretty robust and quite well used service for a lot of years prior to COVID. Of course, we saw that usage skyrocket during the pandemic, um, and that helped us rapidly scale. Uh, you know, our services and adoption, I think one of the things, the breaks on that had been internal, you know, physicians feeling like it, it wasn't their best arena to to serve, but sort of subsequently, of course, that, that has changed dramatically and uh, we've really scaled up. Um, there are still questions there around the, the payment model, but, you know, telehealth has really taken root. Um, although again, we had been on this journey for some years, the digital front door, um, our digital fund door, we call it My Health Plus. We launched that last June, right in the midst of the pandemic. We'd been working on that for about a year prior uh, with a number of different partners. Um, we drew our inspiration since it didn't exist as we needed it within healthcare from um, those outside of healthcare. And our initial scope was really around finding care, managing care and paying for care. Again, some of the same pain points that Katie just spoke to. And we look for who does that best outside of healthcare. And we kind of co-created this with, with consumers as we went. And that was a little bit of a challenge, of course, engaging with consumers during the pandemic for practical reasons was a bit more difficult than prior, but we launched it in the midst of the pandemic. We now have um, close to half a million um, registered users for My Health Plus. Um, and of course, usage has been heavily oriented to things like symptom checking, um, test results and, and just being safe and convenient in, in how you engage with COVID and non-COVID during the, the pandemic. And, and like Katie, we dived into electronic forms again during the midst of the pandemic because it just needed to be done. And so I would say, you know, yes, it's helped us accelerate and scale more quickly. I think the most important thing though is it's really changed the mindset. Suddenly people realize the healthcare consumer is a thing that they're in the driving seat or at least beginning to get hold of the wheel and they're going to drive it from here on in and we've got to we've got to go there too with them so i think that's the most profound change we've seen um so with that i'll hand it back to you michelle thank you kevin that's a great closing statement there um I, um next question is for chris and scott with uh, chris going first as, as we begin uh, hopefully to emerge from this uh, public health crisis uh, while still learning to live with the coronavirus, what digitization approaches will you bring forward from the experience or change? Yeah, I think building off of Katie and, and Kevin's comments, one way that we've, obviously we've had a crazy adoption of virtual care. So you go to a million visits and you did 7,000 the prior year. That's great, it's, a, it's seen as a replacement of in-person care. But what we've been watching is the new behaviors demonstrated by that, that we want to encourage and keep going on. So we have patients doing things like, hey, my sister's in Hawaii and my uh, my uh, father is in 
LA, but the patient's in Northern California. Is it okay if we have the virtual visit with the three of us present? It's like, absolutely, that's really interesting. And we think that new modality is going to change because there's you couldn't do that in person before. So how do we um, look at virtual, not just as a replacement of traditional care, but as, an, as a door opener to totally different ways uh, to think about the care. Um, mental health is a big problem. We use COVID as the opportunity to accelerate uh, initiatives in mental health. We launched a youth and adolescent mental health tool called Scout. It was recognized last week in Fast Company as a world changing idea and just really excited about finding gaps that aren't being well addressed and going right after it. It's not that hard, um, but just getting in there and, and finding a need. And that gets at uh, the care gap. So if we think about traditional care, there's a lot of um, uh, open unnoticed time between visits. So there's a lot of uh, blind spots in care. We don't know what's going on in between visits. And for us, there's a lot of work going on right now to make sure we're listening and that listening is best done through data in between visits. And so uh, there are just that driving um, preventative and proactive action. So while we dealt with the, the virus, we also dealt with horrific wildfires for the third year in a row. And the example that I like to use is we know we knew where the fires were burning. In fact, we had a specific uh, line using data. We knew actually exactly where every employee house was in the system and how close they were to the fire. But for our patients, we knew that the wind just shifted. We knew that smoke was headed towards our towards our asthmatic patients. And we also knew who needed a refill, but we don't combine those data sets. But what we'll do next is be able to drop ship to someone's doorstep an automatic inhaler refill, knowing that smoke's headed in the direction. That's the type of commingling of data that we're going to need to do. And that's just weather plus health. What about other data sets commingled? to go further upstream into building on what Kevin and Katie are talking about. That's fascinating. Thanks, Thanks, Chris. Scott. Well, I, I think like, uh, like, like many organizations, a lot of our early work in digital pre-pandemic was about convenience and access. Um, and then that quickly pivoted um, to a message of safety. And so I think, you know, the, the ability to create um, a series of touchless experiences during this pandemic um, in response to you know our understanding that patients were really deeply concerned about coming into our uh, facilities, and then also our caregivers, you know, were extremely concerned. So I think this message of safety and how digital um, provides a different kind of safe environment is going to be really critical going forward. I also think um, one of the things I'm proudest of, and I, I would I would guess my um, fellow panelists feel the same way, but I think we all learned that we could innovate in real time for actual operational challenges that were happening right now. Um, you know, I think innovation and digital, again, it kind of came off this island and, and got mixed into real problems that we were facing. It felt like, again, I know my panelists feel the same way. It's like we were dealing with problems that we hadn't had to solve almost daily. And mm -hmm. so the fact that innovation and digital got thrown into that mix as help us, you know, problem solve here, I think, is huge going forward and we'll continue uh, to carry that along. I think a great example of that are things like, um, you know, visitor attestations that are done on their phone now. We created virtual waiting rooms where patients could fill out forms um, on the phone prior to the visit. Um, when they arrived at the clinic, um, we, we let them wait in the car um, until we were ready to take them directly into an exam room. At that point, we texted them um, and, you know, people don't like the waiting room, whether there's a pandemic or not. You don't want to sit around with other sick people. And so, so you know, things like this, um, really, really important, I think, going forward. Obviously, everyone's mentioned already uh, urgent care and, and televisits. And I, I think Kevin mentioned the one concern that we have about some of that, which is what is the reimbursement um, situation going to look like going forward? But clearly, there's a large group of patients that really like to be able to visit their caregivers in, in that um, manner. And then, you know, I would mention that you know, twice last year, unfortunately, Arizona was the COVID hotspot, not just of the United States, but of the world. And, uh, you know, during that period of time, um, Banner was providing over 50% of the vaccines that were given out for the first five or six, um, you know, months of availability. And we kept innovating Another good example of like real-time innovation 
Um, we created these kind of unique touchless check-ins for the vaccination pods where patients filled out forms again on their phone ahead of time, and then they scanned their QR code um, at arrival uh, for check-in registration. And then also they got all their educational materials. So, you know, those, you remember the lines in the early days, you're sitting in your car for a long time, you're able to read all the educational material and be prepared once you got up and were ready to get vaccinated. So I think we're gonna carry a lot of those kind of convenience slash safety things, um, you know, as we move forward and, and uh, you know, as Alex Morehouse, our, our chief uh, marketing officer always says, you know, safety has now become a new value uh, for our customers. And so um, we're gonna look at every interaction um, in terms of how to make it touchless and how to make it digital going forward. That's great. You know, that speed to solution uh, lesson learned is, is one that I hear from a lot of our members across the AHA and, and really they're scratching their heads now and saying, how do we keep that and not go back to our old ways of maybe uh, overanalyzing and piloting, you know, fail fast and then move on, right? So uh, speed to solution is what it's all about. So I have got one last question I'm gonna throw open to the, to the panel uh, for anyone who wants to uh, jump in on this one. And um, I would remind our audience that the chat room is available. If you have a question, I see one at least that has already popped in there. But if you have a question for the panel, we'll, we will leave uh, uh, five or seven minutes at the end uh, to, to answer those questions. I, I, uh, so this is the, the final open question. Um, have you one piece of advice about organizational structure or culture work or operations that you think is most important as our field works to optimize the use of digital technologies? Katie. Okay, like I'll go first. Um, it's hard to say in just one. So I, there's one sort of lingering thought as this conversation has, has transpired and it's really around and we take all this great work and all these things we've talked about and and the personalization of the interaction with our consumers and our, our patients. So whether it's the data and we know all these things or the tools, we know more about people than we are able to, to interact. And so that ongoing personalization, I think, is, is another theme um, for really transforming the way um, we move this industry forward. But as far as the one piece of advice, you know, uh, it's tie it back to the strategy so you can help every part of the organization at every level understand the why and it's not just sort of the, the you know the hot technology of the moment and i try to really remind myself and our teams that digital is an enabler and not a replacement mm -hmm. and how we you know kind of foster our, our thoughts and our growth in that um, to make sure we're doing the right things by by our customers so I'll leave it at that thank you katie michelle i'm happy to Thank you, Kevin. Because I think it, it, it builds or it links to something Katie ended there with. I mean, I think for me, the one thing is be consumer obsessed. I am be, I'm that. I've been that all my life. But I think healthcare people aren't typically that. And, you know, we obsess with things like safety and quality and efficiency, but we don't obsess with consumerism and we have to be obsessed. And therefore, keep in mind that people don't want digital necessarily. They want convenience. They want access. They want simplicity. They want enablement, as Katie said, they want empowerment and um, personalization. So I think if you can keep that as your North Star, hopefully you'll do the right thing. Nice, nice you said. So Michelle, maybe I'll uh, I'll jump in next here because um, I think it does again, build on what uh, Katie and Kevin have said. But I, again, I, digital is a cultural change. I think, you know, what I, I, I firmly believe what uh, Katie said is absolutely spot on. I mean, I'm a strategist, so I believe everything major that you're doing in your organization needs to be translated down from your mission through your vision and strategy into action so that there's a clear reason uh, and purpose uh, for why you're doing these things. You have to have top-down support for this work. It can't, it's too big and too heavy of a lift to expect um, you know, sort of a rogue team to carry a large organization through it. Um, so as I mentioned before, part of that cultural change is board and senior leadership, not just buying in, but actively supporting. You got to fund this. Um, you know, if you underfund or don't fund at all, 
Um, the, the man, it just isn't completely demoralizing, you know, to the organization. It's expensive. And so you're going to have to put money and resources behind it to make it work. And then the final thing I'd say, and I think, again, it builds somewhat on what Kevin was, was talking about, but um, this isn't just a project or a series of projects that you're doing um, in digital. You've got to treat it like a core capability, um, muscle memory that you're trying to create in your organization. And you need a dedicated um, leadership team that thinks about it holistically for the enterprise. And as Kevin said, with the customer at the center of this, and that is very different than how large health systems have grown up and been built. And so there's a lot of change management that comes along with that. Great. Chris? Yeah, last comment on, I just agree with radically with what everyone said. And I think the only ad I would put on that is uh, speed, that speed is critical. And, and one thing I do miss already is just how fast we were moving in the middle of COVID and that has slowed. So I, I, I really crave that. Um, the other thing though, what I'd add is letting the outside influence in. So, you know, the competitive side in healthcare, we all know just radically changed. So even the panelists on our call, you know, we're up against some, some massive moving forces here that are very different than traditional forces. And their SLAs are really different and much higher bar on a consumer side than ours are. So how do we allow that influence in? Um, another example of that is a, a, a good friend of mine runs, has our job uh, collectively at Lululemon. So it doesn't sound like, oh, what would be the, what would be the crossover there? It turns out they have the exact same mission statement as our organization, but of, of course they're gonna manifest that in a very different way than we do but we compare notes and it's really um, helpful to let that outside influence come in to say, that's really interesting how you're manifesting that, how you think about that, even the language you're using for that. Now your customer is really different than ours, uh, but how do we let that outside influence um, in for us, not just looking to our left and right in the traditional healthcare space? Yeah, great, great. So um, we do have a, a question in, or two in the chat room. So I will start with the first one that came in. And that question is around how are um, each of your organizations utilizing nursing informatics uh, when supporting the end user during and after um, implementation? So nursing analytics, nurse clinic, clinical informatics. Um, anything you want to say about that? Or I'll jump in um, and maybe it's uh, that we aren't. Um, <laughs> I think that's an interesting question. And, and maybe it's that um, when we think of informatics and the clinical intelligence and things, we're, we're looking at the outcomes, right, for the organization and, and are the programs driving those outcomes? And then from an end user perspective, engaging along the way and perhaps for Piedmont, it's because we've been largely focused on sort of the the hassle factors that surround the care setting first and foremost so that scheduling arrival registration the post uh, visit and referral it's, it's less about sort of the the care setting and care delivery itself um but it gives me something to think about so i really appreciate the question and again, you know, if we're sitting here talking about how you engage all levels of the organization, we don't want to lose sight of, of that core part of our talent and, and care delivery. So, um, you know, and I think that the, this issue of clinical informatics and uh, population health informatics, segmentation of populations, yeah. um, is especially as we're all tackling the equity challenge, um, really, really critical. And you know, mirroring the, the, the those in and, and having that continuous loop of improvement that comes about as a result. Yeah, yeah. And, and Michelle, maybe I would jump yeah. in as well. Um, you know, I think uh, we use a, a protocol, I, I think it's um, Schmidt Thompson, I believe, but it, it was originally um, used as a, on the nurse hotline for, and we use that for everybody now. So we took that, um, informatic tool. We applied it to our call centers. Um, we get about 50,000 calls, you know, per day in our contact center. So we are using it um, for those type of, uh, of means. Great. 
So Kevin, this was a question for you. When we ask our organizations to be consumer obsessed, the next question seems to be, okay, uh, what does that mean as far as what we uh, as far as what we need to do differently? So what specifically do we ask the organization to change and, and or how do we operationalize that consumerism? Yeah, thank you. And thanks Dave for the question. So certainly the obsess word can weird people out, like people think it's taking us to the wrong place, but it isn't. I mean, it's just firstly, I think, look outside of healthcare. We've, we've covered that theme a little bit. Look at companies that do this well. You know that because you have great experiences. Think about the detail as well as the big picture way they deliver on that. Um, I think it also helps to go with the grain operationally. So no doubt a system will have KPIs, will have daily huddles, will have process around even things like safety, um, quality, and, and just try to engage in the consumer, whether you call them a consumer or not, doesn't really matter, um, the patient, in, in ways that are as obsessive as they are. So for us, that means you know daily huddles, daily work. It's just part of how you do things. I think it's really important that people don't take out that this is new work or more work. It's doing your work in a consumerist way. And often that is just about just walking through the experience that you walk through as a clinician or as an operator, as a user, as a patient. You'll just see things in a completely different light and then act on them. Ask those simple questions like, can we help? I've had some terrible experiences where that has just not been part of the mindset. Um, so, so I could go on, I won't, but there's some very simple ways. It's easy to get into, as, um, as Scott said, you know, huge investments in digital tools, but fundamentally consumerism is that, but it's also just the, the human interactions. And just, again, look at it through their eyes. You'll see it differently and then start to act accordingly. That's great. So we are right at time, panelists, and um, I know that I learned a, a, a lot today and appreciated hearing your perspectives on this journey that everyone is on. Um, we at the association are also digitizing, and uh, so um, it's great for me to be able to hear uh, you, you experts from the field and, and where, where your mind is at. So I'd like to just close by thanking our panelists for giving us your time today and your expertise and thanking the participants for dialing in. Um, hopefully all of you have a great rest of your day.